and we are live. Brian, Yay! take it away. Hey, okay. everybody. Welcome to Clear Crop TV. Our host, PPG Grandpa, Sean Shimons. Uh, we got Lindy Anderson here. My dog is choking. Chris, never trust a skinny saying, Chef Shane, JP Tulo. And our guest tonight is going to be David DePino. And uh, David, welcome to the show. <laughs> Good to be here. Hey, here. Everybody, welcome to Clear Crop TV. Uh oh, our back feet. We got feedback. We got back feet. Got <laughs> back feet. So, David, tell us a little bit about yourself, man. How'd you get into flying? I uh, got out of the military. I retired in '16, and uh, I actually suffered from some pretty bad post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, I saw an article about how adrenaline will help you with depression. And so I started doing some dangerous things <laughs> and I felt a little bit better. And I thought, you know what? I could go paramotoring and that would really drive my adrenaline up. And uh, so it did, it did. And it, it actually has been very therapeutic. Wow. Well, what all kind of dangerous things did you do? I got to ask, did you skydive or? No, no, I, I uh, oh, all, all sorts of things went, went caving, traveling. Very cool. Seems like a logical uh, uh, journey you took there. Let's do some crazy crap. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, yeah it worked. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry about the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so how long ago was this? You said you started paramoting, you said? Well, I just started. I my first flight was set September twenty eighth of last year, um, but many years ago, about thirty years ago, I uh, moved into Indiana, and the uh, folks around that area were were doing a lot of trike flying. It was paramotoring, but it was the heavy heavier things from many years ago, and so there was a lot of trikes. And uh, I looked into it; it was very expensive, and I couldn't afford it on a pastor's salary. So I, you know, years later, rind the clock, I, I was here at home in Alabama after retiring and I had never really gotten onto YouTube at all. And, uh, but I started to get onto it, started to look at things and ran into Tucker Gott who went to McDonald's and uh, then saw um, Woody Gamers Tag. What, what is his last name? Anyone know? Woodworth. Woodworth, Woody Woodworth. Matt, he, Woodworth. Matt Woodworth, I think. Matt, Matt, that's right, Matt Woodworth. He's a little bit older and he seemed to relate to, I seem to relate to him. And so I listened and I thought I, I can do that. And I checked into uh, some training and next thing I knew I was doing it. My wife was very gracious and let me buy the equipment. Nice, nice. Speaking of Woody, we were talking about uh, YouTubers last week. Did he, I hope we mentioned him. Cause he's a we great did. one. Did we, did we? Okay, good. Yeah, he's a really great. He puts a lot. He doesn't have uh, as much content as he used to, but uh, he's really got some good stuff out there. <clears throat> now, David yeah. has his own uh, YouTube channel, right? I do, under my name, David DePinho. And I've been uh, recording since I first held out my, my phone, <laughs> my iPhone, and took a picture of myself. Mm-hmm. I think we've all done that. <laughs> I have not done it. I have yet to pull my phone out of my pocket while flying. I don't have a tether and I don't want to lose it. I've got the GoPro. Well, I, uh, I can tell you that when you pull your phone out, it really runs the adrenaline up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll have to give it a try when I can fly here again shortly. Look at that. Am I muted? Nope. Uh, looks like David just broke the big 500 uh, subscriber mark. Congratulations on that, man. That's awesome. Yeah, there. Yeah. It goes up when I. He's got some good videos. I just watched his uh, West Coast and Dells videos. As you know, Devil's Tower was awesome. But I found out I could have gotten a lot closer to Devil's Tower, uh, but I, I didn't. Very cool. Very cool. Hey. Shut Linda, 
Is that Linda's dog? No. Oh, ah. boy. Oh, they, My dogs will start if, if they hear your it's, dog. Yes, yeah, JP's dog JP. this time. I know. <laughs> I love that little dog. He can't give you a hard time anymore, Linda. My dog, yeah, I know, huh? My dogs are not innocent by any means. My dog is chill. He's over here just taking a nap. I know. Mine are like. It's like uh, you fly a scout, David. I've got a I've got a mini plane that I started with, and then later I got myself a used scout from somebody down in Florida. Nice, good pickup. It it is it had about fourteen hours on it, and it came with a reserve. Oh wow! And a, an extra an extra uh, carbon fiber prop. Nice. Got a good deal on it. Now, do you good. run the uh, Helix or the E-Prop? I think it has the E-Prop on it. E yeah. Yeah. And it's a little bit larger. That You know, a lot of them are, what, 125? Um, yeah. I see centimeters. And this uh -huh. one is a little larger. My mini plane is a uh, rigid cage or something like that. And the prop on that is 140 centimeters. Wow. That's huge. Two. Hey, I, I got to ask a question, man. How did you get this video right here? Like, where's the camera? On what? The the shot that he was showing right there was above your helmet, looking down at your GoPro. I I have the GoPro eight here, and then I put right. a a th three sixty behind it. Okay. Uh, That's what I thought it might be. Like three sixty R. Pardon me. Yeah. Is it on your cage mounted? The no, the Insta three sixty sometimes is on the back uh, of my helmet. The oh, GoPro okay. eight here is then a chase camera. Uh, GoPro 5, but now I've gotten that magnet that uh, Dave Wolf suggested on Paramotor Crazy. Oh, the and wing so magnet. I'm putting it up on the top of the wing, the 360. Cool. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> so, Looks like you're on a uh, Roadster. Uh, spider. It's a Spider 3. Yeah. Spider 3. Very cool. What size? It's 24 meter. Okay. Now, nice I, I start. I What's started that? out uh, paramotoring um, with a, a, a fellow that uh, I told mentioned last week that I um, mostly due to my my own fault I would say I, I, it didn't work out. I ended up ended up going uh, down to Aviator, and they sold me the uh, the uh, Spider Three. Now I was had a chance to try a twenty two meter, and they talked me into buying the twenty four. But boy, that twenty two was fast. I like that. Yeah. All right, guys. I am back. I posted our link everywhere uh, since we're since we're live. I can't believe it took eight minutes, nine minutes. Oh my goodness! Um, All right. You guys did really good at uh, hosting the show. I totally appreciate that. Uh, what are we watching right now here? Uh, I think this is David's latest video. Looks like he's flying over an amusement park. David, what's going on here? Oh, I, I see that now. Uh, yeah, this was at uh, Wisconsin Dells, which is the name of the of the city. And I'm explaining as I take off in a field there that uh, one of the homeowners let me use that uh, I found the Wisconsin Dells. A lot of people don't know about them, but they're these rock formations that have been created in the uh, around the river. And uh, I found it when I was going to an army assignment up there and showing some pictures there of of the helicopters and different things I was able to do on that particular uh, National Guard assignment. It was, I think it was reserve at the time. It was two weeks up at Fort McCoy. So right now I'm flying out to where you can see some of the formations and uh, talking about the new high school that the people have there in Wisconsin Dells, which they put a lot of money into. It's really nice. And I'm explaining Dude. that the reason they do that is because it's so cold up there that they need nice places that are warm to stay in. I used to live up in Wisconsin and one of the things that I really enjoyed was going to the Wisconsin Dells and then riding on the ducks. Uh, yeah. Pretty pretty much like uh, over here in Hot Springs, Arkansas, they have ducks also, which is pretty neat. Yeah, they do. Has anybody else ever ridden on the ducks before? I have, they're what real neat. Talking about? They are they are boats slash wow. wheeled vehicles. So they drive around, uh, you're able to see what's going on. Then they go down a ramp and then they change gears and they can float around and wow. uh, boat around like they're a boat. So I guess That's they call them amphibious. 
vehicles. Yeah, they made them. Started making them in World War II, didn't they? I think so. Yeah. So it's like bicycle powered, or like it has an engine. Oh, it has a nice big, big old diesel engine. Oh, wow. good size boat. Yeah, it's a good size boat. Yeah, you can oh. fit a lot of people on it. I'm thinking of one of those like uh, romantic, like swan boat things that you pedal with your girlfriend on and go out on the, <laughs> oh. the river to smooth on. I don't think that's what you mean, is it? Get no, it's a, it's it's commercial. <laughs> think think of a think of a bus, and then think of it going into the water and floating around like a boat. Oh, okay. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> so you go, you're like with a bunch of people. Yeah, I I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. it's really it's really nice up there. Really cold during the winter time, but uh, during the summertime, it's it's really nice, and uh, there are definitely a lot of places to go. Uh, look, hay bales in a field. Oh, don't get tempted, Brian. Brian. Don't get tempted. Brian. Hay bales. Yeah, I was going to ask how many states he's flown in so far. What's, What's that? that? How many states has he flown in so far? Who me? Yes. Um. Not not that many. Uh, Florida, Alabama, Indiana, South Dakota, uh, Wisconsin, and um, that that might be it you, so far. You, you beat us all. You you yeah, you win. That's pretty good. You yeah. win the prize. You win the prize. Yeah, I've only got Florida and Alabama so far. <laughs> I got Florida, Ohio, Kentucky. Kansas oh. is this month. Got Florida, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. Let me go ahead and tell you, flying over the Ohio River, looking down and seeing that water, how fast it's moving. Yeah, I was extra, extra high just, just to get over <laughs> that thing to make sure that nothing bad happened because you're not surviving that if you go in that water. That doesn't sound hey. good. I, I know I, one I could have taken better videos on this Wisconsin trip, but... Uh, I, I'm afraid of the water. I don't go over the water. I do not either. I'm totally with you. Um, I know that uh, one of the things that we want to talk about is all the different views that you have or different perspectives. But before that, uh, before the show, you were telling us that you had a mishap on takeoff. It was a, what, a paramotor crash on takeoff. Can you give us, and you're going to post it on your YouTube, which is... How do we get your YouTube? David DePinho. It's my name spelled. That's that's the name of the channel. And uh, that that's it. Okay. And you are going to be posting something after this. It's uh, tell us about what you're going to be posting and give us give us some of the detail. Nothing gory, well, I, right? Yeah, yeah. I I uh, decided to go up to the the uh, Sturgis motorcycle rally. That was something I thought I really wanted to do. And uh, my wife wasn't particularly interested in going on this trip. So I went alone and that was kind of a mistake because I found that I wasn't comfortable flying too far away knowing that I didn't have kind of like a ground crew to come get me if my, my paramotor went out for some reason. Anyway, I got to uh, Sturgis and that was the first place I had spent any time and I hadn't yet flown at altitude. So uh, the very first day I went out to a park downtown, which had a very short runway and went into the soccer field there. And uh, not only that, I brought my mini plane instead of my, my Scout with the Moster 185 on it. So I was underpowered and here I was at altitude and I didn't uh, set myself up with a, enough distance for the, for the runway. So I started out and by the grace of God, I, I was fortunate and I was able to make it uh, out of there, but just by, by a hair's wisp, you know, it was very, very close. I was able to get to a section of the, of the uh, end of the field where the trees were real low. And then I just stayed on full power until I finally kind of wound around and, and got up and, and flew for a moment. Well, after I was ready to go down and see all the motorcycles and the things downtown by riding along the ridge between town and, and the country, I looked up at my arm 
and I had forgotten my iPhone in the field. Oh, no. oh. And I didn't know what was going to happen to my iPhone, and it's uh, a 10XR, so it was a lot of money, and I wasn't, I wasn't oh, no. going to leave it in the field and keep going. So I quickly turned around, and I said to myself, I'm kind of talking, because in the video that I'm going to put up uh, tonight, the first flight is there. And this the short flight and all the things that I'm saying as I get ready to do the second flight and talking about how I barely made it up and I'm going to back up further and such. And so I get down, I find my phone real quick and I set back up and I head out only to find out that most of what got me up the first time was was beginner's luck. Oh, my goodness. Uh -oh. So well, we got to do with you, David. I, I just posted your link in the description below. So if you, if anybody wants to go check out his uh, YouTube channel, uh, definitely check it out. Uh, can't wait to see what that, now is it already preloaded? Are we ready to see it as soon as it uh, goes live or do you have to upload? I just made it and exported it. It should be up sometime later tonight, after a couple hours after we're done. Oh. Now tell us, was your phone there in the field when you got back? It was, it was just lying there. And, and you can see it in the video, I, uh, pick it up off of the wing and I set it on my chase cam. Now, why I did that, I don't know. I should have just put it on because I keep it on a, a wrist holder so that I can check it while I'm flying. Hmm. So it's down there and you know you see it as the, the video progresses and, and I leave it on the chase cam. So when the chase cam pick gets picked up, the phone gets knocked off and it's just left behind. <clears throat> Now, do you have more than one paramotor? I, I saw the inside of your trailer there for a second. Yeah, in, in my arrogance, I decided that, uh, well, I, I could help my son learn how to paramotor. Nice. And so he's, he's a little bigger than me. He's about six foot and uh, about 200 pounds at the time. And so I went ahead and bought that Scout, and I figured I'd let him use the Mojo large that I, had, I started out with. And I had already bought the Spider 24 meter, Spider 3. So I got him that scout and he started out and I thought as I got ready to let him go up after he had learned to kite and everything, I said, son, I don't think you're going to take that scout up. <laughs> and so we went out to an airport and he did his first flight on a mini plane. <laughs> Just in case anything went wrong. Did he have any formal training or did you teach him? Uh, he, ha he didn't have any formal training. No, I, I taught him. He said six flights. He finished up his sixth flight. And of course he's down in he's college, finishing up college, he's gonna be a dentist. And uh, he said, dad, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do this very often. So he said, why don't I just wait and come back and, and do it when I can, I've got a home and I can keep the paramotor and go on a regular basis. And so that's what we decided to do. But he's successfully flown a few times. Well, that's pretty cool. It's always yeah. interesting to, to hear when people uh, self-train or get some some training from somebody and are very successful that's really good is he planning on doing any uh, formal training once he gets back and starts flying again or is he just going to go up and fly like with you um I, I think that he'll he'll benefit from the confidence of going to a school and so we'll probably send him down to uh aviator ppg okay good deal awesome good dad you are very good. Yeah, it cost me a lot to be a good dad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I know, I know the whole thing on that. <laughs> you that you're Not a dad, but, you know, <laughs> the mom What's thing. That? JP? Did you say you're an aviator alum as well? Or were you self-trained? No, I, I uh, Eric Farewell is a very good fellow, in my opinion. Um, and so I called him up and I let him know that I had had about 40 flights and that I needed to learn more. And I said, I used to be a jet engine mechanic in the Marine Corps. I said, could I come down and volunteer, help out with your, your motors and different things, whatever you need. And so he said, yeah, come on down. And, and he did it really as a, as a point of grace. He did it as a, as a charity. Wow. And so I came down and I volunteered at uh, Lake Wales for three weeks. And then I volunteered at Denellen for three more weeks, camped in my trailer while I was there. And I learned a tremendous amount while I was there about flying and everything. That's awesome. So I wonder, 
I wonder if it's possible to go down and uh, say, hey, you know, I don't have the money right now for training. So how about I um, be an understudy for six weeks like you and you just train me on the side? That sounds pretty good. I, I, I might have to do something like that. Have you met Eric Farewell? He is always in full recruit mode. Yeah. But, uh, they were long days. You get up at, uh, you know, before light and oh, yeah. you're, you're up until well after uh, a, a long day, 12, 14 hours. Wow. Sounds interesting. So um, before we go more in depth into your mishap, I would like to uh, talk maybe a little bit more about Aviator PPG. Um, uh, what you what did you actually do down there for the three weeks, and what kind of training did you get uh, with this just kind of being on the side? Well, I was able to watch everything that was going on. Uh, what did I do? Uh, as soon as I showed up, I started to basically help out. You know, I would vacuum and clean things and wash things and whatever needed to be done. And uh, when I helped over at the uh, at the hangar, uh, I'd fabricate uh, whatever they asked me to. Uh, and the fellow Alex, they've got a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They've got a fellow with his airframes and power plants license. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's certified to work on aircraft and he, he does all of their paramotor work down there for them. And so I helped Alex down there and uh, it was just, it was a good time. I learned a bit from, a good bit from him too. It sounds very beneficial to- Yeah, to shout out to Alex. He's a CFI and uh, he's supposed to help me get my sport pilot's license, Alex. <laughs> yes, he is. And I think he's training the whole staff down there that if they want to fly, he he's is. training them how to fly. I got to go down there and volunteer. That's the only way I'm going to get my training, man. I know there it you now. Go. Oh, you have nothing better to do, right, Brian? I mean, you just hanging around doing nothing retired. Might as well go down there and make some, you know, learn something. A, a trip is in my near future. Aviator will always be on the, the list too. Yeah, I, I, well, last year I didn't have much to offer. I didn't know how to paramotor very well. I hope I'm a lot better. I'm, I'm going to offer, I haven't brought it up to Eric yet, but I'm going to offer again and go down, maybe not for six weeks, but for some time and volunteer again this year. There you if go. he'll have me, if he'll have me. So I heard you say you did start out on a Bojo uh, wing. I did. Okay. That's why I started out on as well. I, I want. I thought about going to Spider as well. But how long did you fly your Mojo before you went to the Spider 3? I had, um, I would say, well over 50 flights. And I really appreciated the Mojo because – I don't know, psychological or what compared to the spider, but it felt like no matter what I did, I was going to be safe on the mojo. You know, it was very, it was very secure for me. And uh, I had flown a little bit before I went on to the spider and I still haven't gone to uh, two to 2D steering yet. I'm still just basically using the brakes, a little bit of, little bit of tip steering with it. Now I got a roster three. And I've also flown a Spider 3, really, really solid. It's very light and it just comes up on uh, um, almost nil wind. You can actually reverse. I wanted to ask you, what do you think of the Mojo being an A-wing and the Spider being a B-wing? Do you feel any difference or do they both feel pretty darn solid? There's a huge difference. Um... The, the spider comes up easier and it's, it's a good deal more agile. It's a more efficient wing. So, you know, while you've got this, this mojo that's never gonna collapse essentially, and it's always gonna be there for you. Uh, it's a little bit more cumbersome when you don't know it until you move on to the next wing. Cause I've never flown like an A wing, I mean, I, I did, I flown a really, really small A-wing, so it kind of felt like a B-wing when I was doing the SIV course, but um, I've never flown. I've always started off, I started off with my Roadster 3, and then I went to this Gin Vantage 3, which is a lot more carbier. Um, it's more of a high B, but um, between the, the Mojo, which is, well, do me a favor, explain how solid and cumbersome uh, just give me a, a total example of this this mojo that you flew, um, and then because 
because I initially was not a trained pilot, I, my first flight was me getting out in the field, having learned how to, how to uh, kite the wing and running. And I, that was my first flight. So I didn't know anything essentially, except pull right, turn right, pull left, turn left. Um, they were long runs because I didn't even know that I was supposed to apply a little bit of brake. <laughs> but uh, the, you know, some people don't realize it, but when, when you're applying brake, you know, you are slowing the, the wing. And so when I first started out, I really wasn't doing a lot of uh, um, weight shifting. So the more you weight shift, the less you have to apply brake and the faster your wing goes and the more stable your wing is, right? Mm -hmm. So when you first start out and if you're not trained, you didn't know that, I didn't know that. So uh, in the early days before I did much weight shifting and the, and the Mojo is less responsive to weight shifting than your more advanced wings. It'll, it'll respond, but not as much. So you're, you're pulling harder um, and you just don't have the fast turns that you do uh, with, the, with the spider. And, and then the spider is the one that you went up on uh, and did your face plant, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, that great advanced wing. That's the one I wrecked on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so tell me the difference now. Now, what happened on this on this um, takeoff crash? Uh, were the trims in? Um, was it just a, a uh, maybe a footing th problem, or what exactly happened? The uh, it, it was altitude, and because I didn't compensate enough by giving myself enough runway. The first time I went up, the wing came up uh, textbook. It came up perfectly and I immediately had lift and I took off and I just barely made it. Well, even though I gave myself more runway uh, for the second takeoff, knowing that I, I was having this problem getting altitude, uh, the wing came up to the left. And so I compensated and had to turn to the left and it didn't get lift as quickly. So I burned all that extra, extra room and now I'm headed toward higher trees. So when I finally got into the air, I got into the air. And uh, another thing that I did wrong was I took to my seat too quickly. So I get into my seat, but then I, as you watch the video, you'll see I almost immediately get out of it. And uh, I realized that I'm headed for that tree. And when I was down at Aviator and I was trying out those nice spider wings, you know, uh, I managed to get one of them into a tree when I came down, I landed. I was just fine, except the wing kept going. And uh, I didn't, the, the spider. I only remember one tree in Aviator. <laughs> the one right out in front of the red barn. Yeah, one right beside the building. <laughs> That's the one. That's well, the one know, over there. The way I understand it is they sell the spider with, with brake lines. They're halfway between the high point and the low point. So they work for both. Have you heard this before? Yeah, that, that way when you let the trims all the way out, you still have brake pull. That's right. So when you're doing a low hang point like the Scout and the mini plane, you want to take maybe three inches off. Well, I I didn't, that wasn't done to those, you know, factory new uh, uh, wings that they had down at Aviator. So it's a little bit harder to apply the brakes. So I've shortened them maybe two and a quarter inch, I think, just because I was shooting for three and it, you know, how you're tying knots, they, they give a little bit. So it didn't come out to be three inches. So I have a lot more brake authority now with, with the wing that I own. Now, what, what is your takeaway from this? Because, you know, we have newbies that listen to the podcast. And of course, you know, people are, are thinking already, it's like, man, I'm, I'm scared with, with, you know, doing something wrong, uh, coming in and crashing or my wing falling or, or busting on, on a takeoff. What could you do differently? What could you tell someone that's listening to this, uh, what you did wrong and how this will never happen again? Yeah, this, this crash was completely 100% avoidable. What I should have done is I should have gone to a place like the Sturgis Airport and done my first flight. And then I would have had an endless runway essentially. And uh, I would have had more of a sense after two or three flights out there of how long it was going to take me. And I never would have found myself downtown at a soccer field to begin with. That, that, was, the, that was, you know, a mistake or an accident waiting to happen. 
And then uh, the next thing is that I shouldn't have gone down there it, it, because it was so much ignorance. You know, I shouldn't have gone down there with a, a mini plane when I was sitting on a scout uh, up the, uh, you know, in my trailer, I had both of them with me. So what I should have done was started out with the scout. I'm at higher altitude. I'll have more, more authority and so forth. So I should have used that as well. Okay. That's, that's, that's good. I'm, I'm really glad that you said that because it really is interesting. I know that when I first started getting into paramotors, I would look at different places and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of places I can take off here in town. After being out in the sod farm and doing my first, you know, 10, 20 launches, I realized that these little places that I have set out for me to take off in town were just way too small, too many trees, possible rotor, and uh, definitely not enough takeoff. I've seen a lot of crash videos where there's definitely not enough takeoff and people are running into fences. And, That's and right. So let's go ahead and ask the panel real quick since we got so many people out here. I'm sure that Brian already introduced everybody, but we have Chris Wheeler, which is my dog is choking. We have never trust a skinny chef Shane. And let's see, we got Brian Haybill Waller, JP Tulio, and of course our our Linda Anderson. Are you are you are you muted? She's... No, I'm I'm here. Okay. <laughs> he is our cheerleader. I was hoping that you're gonna cheerlead for real. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, sorry. Okay, she's gonna cheerlead. I was for like us, so intense listening to everything. So. Yay! Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our, our official cheerleader. Good deal. All the right, let's go ahead. Oh, girl, cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and ask our panel. Let's uh, let's talk about runways and um, how how do you judge your runway? How far? Uh, how small is too small? And how do you judge runways? Let's go ahead and start with uh, Chris Wheeler. He was on a couple weeks ago talking to us and his nickname is my dog is choking i guess if you haven't heard about this uh chris tell us about my dog is choking and then tell us about your runways and uh we'll go back and listen to episode them. 32 what's that i know right where he explained it <laughs> so my dog is choking is my youtube channel uh so just my dog is choking all one word and my dog is choking basically in 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 reference to how I came up with this name and it was 20 years ago, I've had this name. So uh, basically it's uh, test everything. Never believe anything that somebody tries to sell you, feed it to your dog first, see if they choke on it. Basically it's test everything. So, uh, so runway. So I have a habit of getting lazy and on days that the wind is coming from the North, I can fly directly out of my front yard. But if I do, uh, I have to make sure that there's nothing in the driveway because more than once I have almost taken out my truck or myself <laughs> via the truck. <laughs> I, and one of these days I should actually put that into a video because I have more than once to where I'm like barely getting over the truck and I have to like spread my legs just so I don't clip it. Uh, but yeah, so, so, so the way I rate it and then across the street for me is where my LZ is. So I actually have a huge LZ to take off from. Uh, but there are some electric lines that I have to be worried about if I'm going a certain direction and the wind is coming a certain direction. So basically I feel the wind and try to figure out how strong that wind is. And I know my wing enough to know how much wind I need to take off and how much time. And I don't think there's a, a way to equate that. It's just a feel. Uh, you do so many takeoffs, and after a while, you just kind of figure out how long that is. But I will say it's a really good idea to whatever number you think it is, triple that just in case. I like and, that. And especially, and yeah, especially on mill wind launches. And conditions change. You can take off in a shorter uh, amount of time in the wintertime. Yeah, when the when the when the wind is more dense, yeah. <laughs> I like the hand. <laughs> I like that. Good deal. All right. 
Thank, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Let's go over to Never Trust a Skinny Chef. Shane, Shane, tell us about that awesome long name that you have, and then tell us about your <laughs> runway, and uh, what do you think is a too short of a runway, and, and what is an optimal runway? Uh, well, <clears throat> I came up with my YouTube channel name, Never Trust a Skinny Chef Shane, because we're... Or am I frozen? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. No, I, my volume's up. Or my, I'm not You're muted. Good. Okay, let me start over. Thanks, Sean, for breaking up my wonderful concentration that I had. <laughs> um, never trust a skinny chef. Um, I'm not a chef. I just don't trust skinny ones. And just happened to be uh, a guy that put on a few extra pounds a couple years ago and not forgot about it. You're so, a chef. Come on now. No. You're but, gonna, yeah, uh, you're going to send me a sauce so I can uh, get like the salsa recipe. I will tell you. You will know your runway's too short when you don't make it. That is how you know your runway's too short. It usually ends up in a uh, sudden stop of some sort. Um, I just went to the um, the Ohio fly-in, uh, what, last weekend? And uh, let's just say I have a video of me checking the air conditioner on top of a camper at very close uh, proximity. <laughs> if I if I would have had even the slightest hiccup in my motor, I would have been part of the motor home. Mm. Um, yeah, when I took off, I was trying to pull. You see me when I bring the wing up. I'm trying to go to the right, and it just turns and goes right for the camper. Why did I not just kill the motor and reset up? I don't know. You're bare feet. You know. I don't, are you that's bare, beach are flying. you barefoot on there? Yeah, it's beach flying. You're oh, always in Florida. You're beach Here flying. Go. I tried flying with my shoes on and it filled up with sand and well yeah, the whole flight uh, the whole flight all I want to do is kick my shoes off and, and get the sand off my feet. But anyways, you got, yeah. You got a lot of runway <laughs> on the beach. I love it. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not scared to fly over water. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I have flotation on. Um, okay. So, I mean, not that it always works or even 50% of the time, but at any point, if my motor stops here, I have enough glide ratio to make it to shore. That is always, always my first option is to make it to shore before uh, hitting the water. That is a very good thing to think about. Um, for, for newbies out there when they're thinking about runways, um, how long should, or what, what kind of, what kind of length or, or amount of feet or meters or whatever do they need when they're first taken off? If you're, I don't know, maybe under 20 lights. Okay. Well, it, it really depends on the wind. I mean, some of these, this flying that I did, there's two takeoffs that I did. I didn't take more than three or four steps and I was already in the air. Wow. And then there's a couple of videos where I felt like Roy, uh, Forrest Gump and I just kept running because there was no wind. So it really de just depends on the wind and, and uh, your wing. And if you think that you need, you know, that you're, it's going to be a tight takeoff, you probably should not be uh, taken off from there, right? I'm saying say that again. If if uh, you're if you're going to be launching from someplace and you're like man I might be able to clear that tree okay you probably yeah. should not take off from that. <laughs> that that is a hundred percent true um, there's there's a certain point on your takeoff that you can't abort to and then there becomes a point when you can't and it's usually about time your feet come off the ground it's a lot harder to stop. And, and of course, if your motor goes out, then, you know, yeah. when you're coming down, run into a tree, run into something, hurt yep. yourself, damage yourself. And uh, who, who said who said that? Was it Chris? Uh, whatever your takeoff, whatever you think your takeoff should be, you should triple it? Mm-hmm. I agree yep. with that. I would I would totally agree with that, yes. Definitely. But he said he wasn't a chef. Look at all this food, man. It looks delicious. Man, I'm getting hungry just looking at it. Holy moly. That's just a meatloaf. <laughs> I love meatloaf. What are you talking about? Just a meatloaf. Mm. All right. Smoker? Oh, yeah. We also have Brian Haybill Waller. 
uh, Brian, um, let us know why your your nickname is Hay Bale. And uh, what do you think about uh, takeoffs and landings? What kind of field do you need to be able to take off? <laughs> well, the hay bale thing is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, look out for them. Don't fly into them. No, I, uh, I was unfortunate. I kicked the bale while trying to do the hay bale slalom, uh, and I broke my foot. But anyway, <clears throat> that was a previous episode. And they brought me on to interview me and haven't been able to get rid of me yet. But I've been lucky enough to have a, a runway in my front yard. It's about 1,500 feet grass runway. Um, runs north to south. And when the wind's out of the north and south, it is perfect. But when it's not, and it's out of the east or the west, uh, I deal with rotor pretty much uh, coming off trees from whichever direction. Uh, sometimes there's no wind and I just use a runway. But um uh, I've only landed at an airport, Lake Wells, and in my front yard so far, so two locations. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time. I probably got about 40 flights at home. So anyway, yeah, yeah a good runway is one that's long enough to take off and you don't have a whole lot of obstacles like trees and, and to, to look out for and you don't have to worry about rotor. The bigger, wider open area that you can get, the better for sure. My first um, solo was out at an airfield, an actual airport, a municipal airport. And there was nothing in front of me, but the sides, there was some trees and power lines because I did not understand the torque. When I took off, I torqued off to the right and I barely skimmed over the power lines and treetops. It was really, really cool. However, right. since then, I have no problem taking off. I can even turn to the left, even though my uh, motor prop or my motor uh, torques to the right. And boom, chaka laka laka. There goes Brian nope. McMill. Yeah, that was my last flight. That was almost exactly three months ago. So, uh, yeah, I should be flying again soon. Mm. All right. God, it never gets better. Every time yeah, it's that is last time. Let, let's stop that one because we want to be able to, uh, you know, bring children on this and, yeah, and watch. I made the uh, Tucker Got Crash Review Series. So uh, that's, I guess that's all I'll say about that. Because yeah. um, it was so awesome. And of course, you can go over to Brian Waller's YouTube channel, which has 287 subscribers now. Holy smokes, you're, you're really rolling, dude. I know, also noticed too, JP, that you have not hit his bell notification. What are you talking about? There we what go. <laughs> Wait, y'all turn uh, those on? <laughs> I, I, I turn them on and all, with, with all you guys, so you know I can check out your videos. But um, anyways, thank you, Mr. Brian. I appreciate that. We also have JP in the house. JP! What's up? Tell us about, um, well, your cool name and <laughs> where we can find you and tell us about your runway and take uh, situations well, my LZ. handle is just my name basically my name is john paul vitula uh, hence jp tula um yeah it's uh, just kind of rolls off the tongue i guess uh, as far as runways i would say uh it's 120 flights or whatever you need at least a couple football fields um if you if you have to question yourself it's probably too short like you, like like the other guy said, if you're not sure, then it's, you probably need a little more room because uh, whatever you think isn't going to happen is probably what's going to happen, at least when you're first starting out. Once you get more comfortable and confident and you get some more uh, flights and landings under your belt, you'll know exactly what you're, uh, you're capable of. And then you'll know, you know, what kind of uh, – run out you're going to be looking at depending on the wind conditions and you know just like they were saying uh sometimes it's two steps and you're in the air and uh when the wind's like that it, it's going to be a pretty short um landing when you're coming into it with in strong wind conditions but in, in no conditions you're going to need a lot more space and that's just something that you um you know acquire uh that knowledge as you gain more experience and the only thing you can do is get out there and fly and just rack up those hours um the more you do that the, the more comfortable you'll be and you'll just you know know the answer is like that like uh, 
the other night I went out for a flight and just the conditions felt so good and it's like yep I, you know the wind's coming out of here 100 percent. i know i'm gonna nail this launch not even a question i have perfect layout you know i've got a perfect amount of runway in front of me um and it was you know when it comes together and you just uh the more experience you get um the more you, you see that so get out there and fly it's freaking awesome and it's not really about how um, how many hours you have it's really how many times have you taken off and That's landed something. yeah yeah hey hey i would add um jp kind of reminded me they're talking about runways but um i did fly one third location down in florida and i kind of just followed somebody because they said that it was a you know you, they were taking off sideways across a runway and i looked ahead and there's like a barn and power lines and trees there's a short cross runway takeoff because that was into the wind I didn't really feel comfortable doing it, but he did it. And I said, okay, well, I can, I could do it too. And I did it and it was close, but it was, it was unnecessary risk that I took. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that was just kind of a peer pressure thing that you see somebody else do it. You think you could do it too. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably going to come back and bite you sometime, you know, so just, just look out for that. I would say. Absolutely. Definitely. One of the things that I've been doing lately is I've been trying to figure out, um, my runway, you know, how much room do I need? Because I've been trying to land close to places and do more videos of actually going places. So recently what I've been doing, which has been pretty interesting is I've been trying, I mean, in a bigger field is I try to lay out a, uh, you know, a, a certain amount of room. And what I do is as soon as I take off, I immediately spiral to the right pull lots of break and try to spiral upward in a small spot. And then I get up to, you know, maybe, you know, a couple hundred feet. And then I'm, uh, I tried to come down and land in that salt small spot. It's not really a small spot. It's a big field, but I can kind of tell if I can, you know, get in uh, spiral down, then swoop into a landing which is really good because my friend Tommy, which who's, who is not here right now, um, that's normally on our show, he found a really, really small field to fly out of, which is right down the road from his house. And if you remember, that's the one that I had to come in and you know, basically treetop kick the trees and then swoop down between a couple other trees just to land. That was sketchy, but the more you do this, the more you figure out, you know, what you're able to do with your paramotor, the more places that you can get in and get out safely. I still have not flown or foot dragged underneath power lines. That's, that's still too scary, but I've seen a lot of people do it. I'd like to I, mention I, that as you progress, as you progress in wings as well, um, you're gonna need more distance to take off. So especially as you go to smaller wings or you start going from like an A to a B wing or that kind of thing, um, it's something that you definitely have to take into account. You're, you're gonna need a lot more time to take off and, and land too actually because uh, your landings are gonna be a lot faster too. You know, that's really interesting that you said that. I went from uh, Roadster 3 which is being fixed right now. So hopefully I'll be getting it back. It's already been gone for a month. I'm really surprised I haven't got it back, but they said about six weeks for repairs. So I got a 28 meter Gen Vantage and it only has A's, B's and C's. And there's a lot less fabric and it is kind of, it's a higher B and it carves more but it's a hybrid, it's a hybrid mountain slash PPG wing, which means it has a lot of lift. So this one, even though it has less fabric and it has um, less lines, it actually takes off a lot better than my Roadster 3. Go figure. I, sounds I like I got there at the perfect time. Hey, Kevin, what's up, man? <laughs> hey, hi, Kev. Kevin can fly at kevincanfly.com. Welcome to the show. Sorry for my tardiness. I had to deal with some domestic issues. <laughs> but no. uh, okay. 
She was yeah. beating you up again, Kevin? No, I... I, uh, I get out of that neighbor, unhealthy... Uh... My neighbor put up a new fence. And when she put up the new fence, she put it three feet to the inside of her property line and left a section exposed so my animals can just go in and out. And my, my dogs and cats and everything can just go in and out of the yard. It's not sealed. So I went out there today and put up a little three foot section to finish the yard off and she lost her mind and now she's all upset about it. So I had to take care of that. The joy the, the joys of first world nonsense when you live in an HOA. Oh, exactly. I, I live in yeah. HOA too. So kind of crazy. What we're talking about, Kevin, is uh, runway space. How much runway do you need as a newbie? And um, all of it. <laughs> tell us tell us what you tell your students as I far tell as them, room. I tell them that runway behind you is runway wasted. Is is basically in a nutshell the way I look at it. So if if you have a field, you could have 500 yards of clearing ahead of you and and most of us know it doesn't take 500 yards to get off the ground and climb out, but if you were to park in the center of that 500 yards that gives you 250 yards if you have the ability to drive to the opposite end and start at the opposite end the further away from mechanical rotor you have the smoother the air is going to be which means you're going to have an easier inflation so you always want to be furthest downwind from any obstacle you can find and then secondly like i pointed out runway behind you is just runway wasted so if you bring your wing up and say you have a wingtip cravat that's something that we could fix while we're taxiing. You can pump the wingtip. You can even grab your Stabila line and, and pump the, the wingtip out from your Stabila and get it to come open. But you have to be running for that. And that's going to eat up, you know, 40 to 60 yards worth of jogging along while you're monkeying with your wingtip before you commit to fly. Or you, you know, quote, fail the launch, abort the launch, walk that 60 meters all the way back, lay your wing all the way out, do the whole thing over. And as we all know from failing launches, it's really tiresome. The gear you normally wear on the ground makes you hot and sweaty. And then by the time you get in the air, then you get the chills because the, the cold air rushes over the sweat and makes everything uncomfortable for like 20 minutes. So I always set myself up for the greatest success possible. I set myself up downwind as far as possible with as little runway behind me as, you know, as long as it's safe, I'm not going to put my wing up into a tree trying to inflate it or something like that. And then aim at your target, chin up, eyes up as far out as you can see, just like when you drive a car. So you aim, take a pick an aiming point, keep your eyes up, your chin up and move forward and aim at your aiming point. That's what I tell them. Sorry, it's long winded. No, that's good. Um, when newbies are, when newbies ask you, it's like, how much space do I need in feet? It really depends on wind. It depends on a lot of factors. What are some of the factors, and what do you tell your students in general? I tell them at least three hundred feet of open space before there's a bush or any obstacle to have to worry about. How about how about um, obstacle fix fixation, object fixation? and how to avoid that when you're taken off. We can only talk about it because everybody has their own mental process when they get into target fixation. Um, guys that do a lot of extreme sports, whether it's snowboarding, snow skiing, motorcycle riding, uh, those kind of people, they generally understand the concept of target fixation because when you snow ski or motorcycle, you, 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 know, you kind of go where, where you look. And so if you don't want to hit a tree or don't want to smack a guardrail, you got to look into the turn or look away from the tree. So flying is kind of the same way. If you don't want to fly into a tree or a building or an obstacle, you have to be looking and flying where, where you want to go. Sometimes that's easier said than done. <laughs> and then sometimes we go into a panic mode where it can feel like we reacted quickly, even though from a person on the ground standpoint, we watch going, pull, do something, oh God, what? And you're just like, Grr. and you see them barely clear a fence and you're like, oh God, you're like, come on guy. You're like, let's make smarter choices, right? You're like being a good pilot isn't about doing tricks. It's about making smart choices. So I, I think that's a big one, big takeaway from, you know, when you start doing launches is, 
when you commit to your launch, you have to mentally process the whole launch all the way through and make sure that it's not only that you're committed to it, but that everything is going through your checklist as they're supposed to. And then when, you know, and it happens real fast, but as everything goes step by step, by the time your fourth or fifth footstep hits the ground, you should have looked up at your wingtip. You should have checked your brake. You should have rolled onto power. You should have thrown your shoulders back for posture and if things don't feel right, then that's when you would then look back up again to see what's going on. Do I need to abort? Do I need to do something? But those, those two emotions, that all has to just come from repetition, whether it's repetition with kiting practice or just multiple flights. Uh, uh, there's a big discrepancy between the mentality of a newbie, whether they should have more hours or more flights. I say when you're starting out, you should have your first couple of flights be roughly a half an hour. So you get a full understanding of the flight. After you get over those first three flights, roughly a half an hour, then you, we transition to making our approaches and our landings stable with no oscillations and going from maybe like a 150 foot circle down to a hundred foot circle down to a 50 foot circle and then ideally getting within say a 20 foot spot. And by the time we finish training and we send guys out to go be pilots on their own, they should be able to come in and put themselves within that 50 foot circle minimally every single time, whether the engine is on or off dead stick, it, motor died, whatever, doesn't matter. They should be able to come back and hit that 50 foot circle. Absolutely. So a lot of good information right here. Now we're coming up on our hour of our podcast. So let's go ahead and finish off with uh, asking uh, David one more question. One of the things that he has on his podcast, I mean, on his uh, YouTube channel is different views. He's using different camera views, which is really interesting. So check out his uh, YouTube channel. I got it in the link below in the description. But uh, David, tell us that Tell us some of the different ways that you are mounting cameras and what kind of views you're getting. Well, I, I started out with the GoPro. Are you there, David? The... Yes, can you hear me? It, it, they, some folks can hear me. I, got uh, you I, started, I started out with the GoPro on my, on my helmet and uh, watching Tucker God, I saw that he had put something in his shoe Mm -hmm. So I did that and I put uh, a GoPro 5 in my shoe and used that for a while. I still do that sometimes, but uh, I then got myself a uh, 360, which I also mounted to the helmet and put behind the GoPro 8, which is what you'll see. And you, it doesn't appear that there's anything up there. There's, you know, cause it hides the, the connection. The, uh, the, the uh, software removes the connection. So you don't know, you don't see it. And uh, then I bought uh, this um, magnet. This, no, uh, well, I did. I bought the magnet to put the 360 up in my wing, but I also bought this little handheld camera with a uh, a gimbal in it. What's that thing called? Oh, the Osmo. The, the G, yeah, yep, yep. I got the, the DJI, DJI Osmo. Osmo. Yeah, I have one of those. But I have almost never used it because I'm afraid. I, I live in an area where I've got a military base near me. So I usually fly at about seven to 900 feet or, or lower or a lot lower. And so when you're only up at 900 feet, you don't really want to take your hands off very much for a long time. And so I keep my hands on the controls a good bit and I don't pull that, that Osmo out to use it. So I, I haven't used it much uh, so far. We'll see maybe when I get out to... Uh, Fredonia, Kansas, when I get up a mile. So this is my this is my chance to go up a mile. This next That's uh, cool. Next time. Tell us about the magnets and how does it work as far as getting a view from your wing with magnets. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, since I put a uh, a 360 up there, the uh, Insta 360R, uh, Dave Wolf from Paramotor Crazy, he he showed this connection, and I went out and bought it that night and uh, got it and put it on, and because it is a 360, you can look all over the place. So I've got one called a, a new paramotor perspective or something like that, where I'm tracking with a with a uh, with a mini car down the down the highway, and then I pull off from it, 
that's a fellow that was a friend of mine, but it's, it's kind of neat. So I like it. Dang, well, you're pretty high tech there, David. The only thing you're missing, man, is flying a drone around you while you're flying your paramotor. Well, I've got a friend here in the area and he's a big drone pilot. And so uh, he, he contacted me, said, hey, man, let me let me take some pictures of your drone. And so I've got one of the uh, videos on the thing with with a drone, too. <laughs> My wife said she's not going to run a drone for me to take more more views. Yeah, one of these days I'm gonna to have to do the same thing. Bring my uh, my DJI Pro up there and fly around while I'm flying. Definitely, um, we're at uh, an hour right now. So if you need to go, David, you're more than welcome to go, or you can stay on. I'm gonna stay on. I, I wanted to throw something out real quickly. When I took off from Custer State Park in South Dakota, uh, it was another place where you were high at altitude. And uh, right after I got done and I had had a successful flight, I called Eric Farewell and uh, he told me, he, remember you said that uh, your more advanced wing has a lot of lift? Right. He was saying that's because uh, he said, you know, you don't have to go to the Mojo. You'll get as much lift out of your spider because it's more efficient. Yes, yes. This one's supposed to be really efficient because um, you should be able to use this, to, even with trims all the way out and speed bar, you should be able to use your brakes with uh, full trim and full speed bar. Um, I've, yeah, but the trims are like that. My roadster goes, you know, out like that and it has speed bar. Um, but yeah, it has lots of lift. I, I turned the Vario on when I first uh, flew it just to, just to see the, the, the lift. And this thing lifted so much, it was unbelievable. Uh, definitely, that's gonna be the one that I take up when I try to do my 18,000 feet uh, flight. Wow. Oh, speaking about 18,000 feet, what's the highest that anyone's gone so far? I've only gone 5,000 feet, a little more than 5,000 feet. How about the rest 20, of the ground lift? <clears throat> 20, what? What was that? We I've only been 2,300 2,300? Um, four, a little over 4,000 on the uh, SIV course being towed, and then 3,800 in the paramotor. Nice. I did... Uh, a little over five. 5,000? Nice. A little over five. Yeah. Kevin? <laughs> I've been to 9,500 on my paramotor, and then I've been to just shy of 12,000 on my paraglider. Nice. I'm um, right there. I did uh, 12,400, I think. Um, MSL. Wow. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard so many paraglider pilots. After they like 5,000 feet, it all looks the same, anyways. It just. I don't know, man. 500 feet up. Comfortable, man, but five thousand feet. I, I, I'm a little more nervous. Really, the higher you are, the safer it is. Is the, I know. Go, I get it. Go physically. do the go. Go do the SIV course. You'll be like five thousand. Let's go. No problem. I'll tell you what. There's nothing like taking off on a big thermic day right around one o'clock, getting up to <laughs> ten thousand, jumping on bar, reaching in your pocket, and pulling out a little power bar. And having a nice little snack and a drink of water as you go thermal hopping. And then you grab the next one, core back up till you're up somewhere around the moon. And then jump back on speed bar and do like an 80 something kilometer cross country over to Primeville Lake. And then wind up landing over on the lake shore bed, which you can't even see from the mountain at all. Wow. It's, now, is, I mean, is this motor thermaling or just? Mountain? No, that's, free, that's, that's central Oregon free flying. I mean, if, if, if anybody wanted to make a, a, a trip and Kyle o got to experience it when he was here, uh, Pine Mountain in Central Oregon during the summertime kicks off some amazing lift, like amazing world-class lift. The world record distance, or not the, let me rephrase, the state record distance was set from Pine Mountain here in Oregon. And somebody flew from Central Oregon all the way north to the border of Oregon, Washington, out at a whole different flying site. <laughs> wow. It's pretty, pretty amazing. So some there, there's two different places. There's one down by Medford and then one over near Bend. 
in Central Oregon. And both of those two have very similar characteristics for microclimate. And that microclimate allows you to get really high and then go really far. It's pretty amazing. And how long have you been free flying, Kevin? Since 2002. Has in, does anybody else free fly or we all just motor people here? Not on purpose. <laughs> can, can I ask Kevin a question? Yeah, go for it, David. Um, I was speaking with uh, Tom Kubat and he said that even though he knows he's safer higher, and when he's doing acro, it, there's a, a, a heightened sense of uh, anxiety. And someone that was standing nearby said, that's because your, your frame of reference is smaller. So what would you say to that? Uh, it, it's, I, I think you're, you're more or less on the right track. I, what it comes down to is perception. So as you go up, everything becomes smaller around you. It's almost seems like the horizon goes further out and further away, which like you guys were saying already, it, you know, just being at altitude kind of gives you some anxiety. Now, when you start loading up G's and doing acro, even though you have that safety margin to throw a reserve, there's always that thought that's in the back of the human mind that says I could be falling from X amount of millions of feet, right? <laughs> and that in its own right is just simply terrifying. Nobody wants to do that. So even the most competent pilots and some of my friends that are some great acro pilots will, will tell me that their biggest fears isn't being up high and doing the acro maneuvers. It's actually launching. It's when you're taking off off of a, an ocean cliff or off of a big mountain cliff, if you were to take a big frontal or if, if you were to have a big collapse right as you're leaving that cliff face, that's the most daunting time. Once you have the altitude, you, you get more comfortable with it over time. It's kind of like becoming comfortable with G's. It doesn't come all at once. You don't just go up, throw a bunch of G's and say, yeah, I'm good with G's. You got to start with small wing overs and small spirals, which feel like a lot of G's after you go to an SIV course and then do a full nose down <laughs> quick and six G spiral. Then you realize, <laughs> holy crap, I wasn't doing anything. I was right. barely, barely even finding my seat. When yeah. you hear Tucker talk about breaking seat boards, you're like, oh, come on. And then you go do a full flat nose down spiral and you realize, oh, okay, I see why he's breaking seat boards. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it really is just that 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 perception of the world around us and every day is different and that goes back to that i'm safe checklist because every single day we have a different emotional state some days we have more of an adrenaline seeking feeling some days we want to be at peace some days we might be fighting with our significant other or maybe i just went through the drive through to grab some uh, um, unnamed drive through McMeal and <laughs> and the, the gal messed up my order and now I'm upset because you know I spent nine dollars on on what was supposed to be a happy meal and now I'm an unhappy meal kind of guy and I'm going flying so that emotional response changes from day to day and so on Monday I might be able to go up and do spirals and barrel rolls and just throw the bullhorns and it was great and on Tuesday just a couple of light wing overs makes me feel in my gut. I feel like something's off. I feel like something's wrong. I just don't feel like it's right today. And it's just, that's that gut feeling. Some people push through it. Some people listen to that gut feeling and they tone down their flying and they just go, Hey, I, I can do a couple foot drags and be happy with that. That's okay with me. And that's the perception and, and the I'm safe. So you have to check yourself and be real with yourself. Am I safe to do this today? And have I had medication? Have I had enough hydration? Have I eaten? Did I get sleep? Am I in an emotional state where I'm happy and content? Am I prepared? Is my equipment prepared? These are all like, it's, I know it's a, a lot of, to check off mentally, but there it's, you know, to go up and, and put yourself in a scenario where you're going to be doing big wing over spirals, barrel rolls, things like that at altitude, you, you really need to go through your checklist and make sure that all of those ducks are in a row because we have the rule of three. And if you get to two, you need to stop. So if I don't really feel good, but my equipment's good and the runway is good and the air is good, I could probably still go fly. I could get over the hump of one. 
Now, if my motor is not really running right, maybe my motor is acting up and then I'm not feeling good. Now we've hit two. Once we go to three and the air switches and I have to lay out my wing again and now I'm frustrated because now I'm tired. I just carried my motor. I got to change my wing. I've hit three hurdles in the day. And by that third hurdle, we have to stop and completely reassess what's going on because that's what we call compounding injury or compounding problems that creates more problem and it's pilot induced. We start creating problems for ourselves and then one leads to the next one and they compound because a bad layout turns to a bad inflation. My motor wasn't running good and I'm not really feeling good. And I just flew right into the side of this guy's freaking hangar today. And now I'm, you know, paying for a hangar to get fixed. My motor's all busted and I'm going to a hospital. We didn't check the I'm safe. We didn't stop it too. We made it all the way to three and maybe went beyond that. So that's, that's kind of the takeaway from the perception point of view is how are we perceiving the day? What's our emotional state and how do we acknowledge that emotional state? Does that answer? <laughs> yeah, good, good answer. Appreciate that. So David, you've been flying for a while, man. We've all kind of had these moments when we're flying, we're like, oh crap, or things are not looking good. What, what's, the, what's the scariest moment you've been in so far? Oh boy. <laughs> scariest moment. I, I think the scariest thing was I, I like to take off from my front yard, which it isn't really long enough to take off on. So whenever I do it, I'm accepting a certain amount of risk. And so I set up and I didn't make sure the tension lines, that the, the tension knots were, were out of my lines. And so I took off, I got into the air, I just cleared the trees at the end of my, my lawn. And I am really pulling hard to the left because there's this tension knot up there. And I looked up and saw it and I thought, I'm, I'm going to go down, I'm going to wreck. And uh, I thought about it and I remembered, you know, yeah. something that aviator PPG all the time. They say, the first thing that a pilot has to do is pilot his craft. That's right. Remember hearing that? Fly. So I decided, well, I'm going to, I'm going to fly this thing and I'm going to take care of that, that tension knot, you know, Get and some so altitude. I just, I got some altitude. I kept working on it. I finally was able to stow one of my brakes and I went up and I started working on it. Before I knew it, I was completely free and I finished an hour plus long flight. But uh, I just, that was the scariest time. And also it, it created a certain amount of confidence later on. So you said earlier that you used to be a pastor. Um, yeah. what, what is your pre-flight prayer like? <laughs> uh, bring me back safe <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one uh, right, I yeah, want to make sure back. that I've prayed that I've, I've taken time and paid up my insurance for my wife <laughs> <laughs> but don't, don't get skinny chef started on that insurance now <laughs> The insurance salesman? <laughs> no, but um, a lot of your life insurance policies um, do not cover aviation accidents unless it's a fair ticket price, which means you buy a ticket for like um, Delta or American Airlines. So if you just decide to go skydiving or paramotoring or um, paragliding and you fall to the sky and you die, you're life insurance policy will not cover you unless wow. it's specifically for aviation which that's what i had to do i paid like 230 dollars for the year for like 150 thousand um right like a rider in, yeah you ha it has to be um for it has to be for aviation for them to cover it so at least this will cover my debt and well, that she won't have to worry about, you know, paying for the house and the truck payment or whatever, everything will be covered. Um, she just won't 
this way, if I, you know, if I have any more, then I have to sleep with my eyes open because I worry about <laughs> she willing to cash out. You know what I mean? So, so you got a new boyfriend lined up. She's just waiting for the phone call yeah. that that paramour took you out. Yeah, she's always messing with my wing. I don't understand why. She's got a little knife and she's just chafing lines. Oh, and no. <laughs> hey, now, of does anybody have liability insurance for their paramotor? Um, I've heard it is possible to get it. It protects you uh, if you damage somebody else's property, like if you kicked her hay bale and you damage her hay bale or something. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you, have, I, you have to be uh, after a I member. Got my- after I got my car broke into and I found out that my homeowner's insurance nor my car insurance would cover the wing or the motor, they, they stated that it's an aircraft. Same principle as like uh, Shane was talking about with the life insurance. So your standard homeowners and your standard automobile insurance, they won't touch the wing, the reserve, or the motor. They consider that an aircraft. Same with a parachute. Now, so, a quick question. Um, when we were studying, I, I can't remember where, I learned that the, the paramotor comes under different law. It's, it's not under the law an aircraft. It's a vehicle. That's right. So does that, well, does that matter? Uh, according to the insurance company that I argued with many times over, they considered an aircraft. They consider the wing an aircraft. Huh. So... I'm not sure because they're a, a broker. I'm not sure what specific company they found to do it, but it was only like $110 a year I had to pay for the liability insurance. So it's theft, fire, or collision. So basically, it's like the same as as a um, your your car or boat insurance would be. So if if it catches on fire, burns to the ground they'll replace it for fair market value. So I had to take pictures, send them pictures of the current condition that it sits in and then uh, itemize the engine, the frame, the harness, the reserve, the container, you know, and then provide the current market cost to everything that was there. So that way in the event of a replacement, it's not like I'm going to say that I had a, a 1998 PAP that I bought from Indonesia for $500 and it burned in a fire and now today it just became a brand new scout that burned down. You know what I mean? So their, their leverage in the liability is, is having the pictures for the coverage. So like I said, it's like $110 a year. They cover the wings to the replacement cost of a new wing. And then they cover the motors to the replacement cost of what it would be what I have. So who do you go through? Do you go through your car insurance or do you go through something different? I, I, I use a, uh, a, a state farm broker that's here in my little town. I like, I like to be old fashioned and go in and sit down at desks and see people face to face. I don't like being as impersonal as just another guy on the cell phone. So I, I see my, my local broker agent and, and to give him my business for that stuff. Come on, Linda, pull it together. <laughs> I hear a dog. JP's muted. <laughs> I know, I know. I uh, okay. She muted herself. She's so nice. <laughs> no, I, I sadly I found that one out the hard way because, like I said, I had my car broke into. So I had two wings, two harnesses, helmets, a few Cena's, my 360 cam, my GoPros, um, a Mavic, a bunch of garbage skulls got taken one night. And they weren't yeah. insured at the time. Uh, I thought they were because I had homeowner's insurance and full coverage insurance for my car. So I, when I called and made the, the insurance claim, they told me they would cover like the helmets, the Cena's, the radios, the GoPros. But then, like, like I said, like the big ticket item, when it comes to a $3,000 wing, they're like, well, sorry, we can't do anything about that. Wow. So, you know, so at, at the end of the day of, of call it a $12,000 bill got turned into a couple hundred bucks. So some of it was covered, but like I said, anything that they deemed an aircraft, the wing, the reserve, the harness, the motor, they consider all that to be essential or portions. Anything that goes flying, they said, is essentially the way they write it. But you can get it covered if you actually ask them yeah, so if you call it. an agent, tell them what you have, what you want to do, 
they can create a policy for your equipment. And it's through your homeowners or your or your car insurance or both or who I do just, you actually go through? I just it's through a broker. So it's like you were saying earlier, it's a writer. So it's a separate separate insurance writer altogether. And because it's a broker, I'm not, I, it's, for all I know, it's Sam's insurance company. <laughs> it's, it, it all comes in just one bill labeled State Farm, but State Farm <laughs> themselves broker it out. So if someone was an insurance just, agent knew more about insurance, they probably could correct me on a lot of this. <laughs> I know Paramotor's not insurance. I just looked on Google and I typed in Paramotor insurance. And the one that popped up first is from Foot Flyer. And there is something about it right here. So I guess just do a Google search for paramotor insurance. And uh, if you have any questions, definitely get up with kevincanfly.com. Yeah, I'm just curious. That's why I brought up the question because I know somebody else that did, did finally get insurance. They had to be a member of the uh, U.S. Um, Powered Paragliding Association. Um, I think they also had to be a member of the United States Ultralight Association to qualify for it. But anyway, hey, David, uh, do you still have your mojo, man, or did you sell it? Well, you know, that's interesting. I didn't talk about this at all tonight, but I want to buy. Uh, I went down there and I talked to Travis Burns and Kyle, and yep. they, uh, they have this uh, fly products uh trike tandem trike that they set up and i think with the engine with a double hoop and electric start and the fly products trike uh and a wing you're going to be in for somewhere about fifteen thousand yep. dollars and so what i think i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead and sell the mini and the mojo and buy that so that's now, isn't that's that my... the same unit that, that tucker just bought the uh, it, fly products yeah, it is, flash, but I had the idea the first. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. We, we believe you, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I was down there uh, this last winter, um, I priced it all out. and But I was, you know, very new at the time. So now I'm ready to go get the tandem uh, qualification lessons so I can get certified to do tandem. There you go. As soon as I broke my leg. Um, I regretted having the Maverick, uh, the Parajet. I wish I had to fly products because I wanted the trike. Um, I feel like I could have been flying the last couple months, right? Um, if I had, if I had a trike, and, and you know, going out and buying a whole new paramotor, you know, to do that didn't really seem feasible to me. I tried to have patience and just wait to the foot launch. But, uh oh. Yeah, hey Brian. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> Brian, you're in luck. You're in luck. I'll send you the link when when we get done with the show. But they actually make a lightweight trike that bolts right onto the Maverick now. Who came up with that idea, David? Trouble in the house. Uh oh. What's going on, <laughs> David? What's up, everybody? Hey, Sean. <laughs> Howdy. What's going on, brother? How you doing? It's like, hey. it's, it's like awesome. somebody remembered our username and password to uh, to. <laughs> Because I didn't post it nowhere. Oh, he has a dial. He saved it from last time. Is it okay if I jump in? Sure, you can pirate. Of course it is. You're always. I don't know. Wait, let's take a vote. Hey, take I can. Vote. I can is jump. That, wait, is that David or is that Rick? I can't tell. The <laughs> <laughs> I gotta smell his wing. If his wing smells fishy and like oh mud, my god, then then it's Dave. It's definitely I, me. I, that. <laughs> I've got a quick Stinks. paramotor crazy story for y'all. First of all, David, thank you for your service. Appreciate that. You, Much brother. respect. Much love. Thank Absolutely. you. Do I go down to uh, uh, the Palm Bay fly-in? I think yep. it was. No, it wasn't Palm Bay. It was uh, Live Oaks up in northern Florida, right, Dave? Swanee. Swanee. That's right. And I showed up I there. Brand new paramotor pilot. Too. But I knew David Wolf. I knew Paramotor Crazy. And so I arrived there and I'm looking all over the place and I see this one guy that I know. Well, there's other, other people there that have got video channels and YouTube things. And I come up and I say, I, I know you. And he said, and 
I think it was David. David said, do you know anybody else here? And I said, no, nobody else. <laughs> I, I did. I don't remember saying that. <laughs> but I didn't know another soul, but I recognized him. So, And then he gave me a sticker. There you go. That's all he gave you? Good Lord. I got a rash. Yeah. What? I didn't give that to you. <laughs> I met both of you for the first time down at Palm Bay. Yeah. That's where I met David DePeno and David Wolf. Yeah. Got a paramotor crazy sticker. <laughs> Apparently, the guy gives them out to everybody. <laughs> everybody and anybody. <laughs> now they got to come I, waterproof. I got to tell you, it's I, I've been going through an emotional. I'm watching. I hope you guys watch Glenn Tupper, Tupper's uh, videos at all. Any of you guys watching his videos? Glenn Tupper. Uh, yes, no? yes, 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 yes. So he's got the uh, he's got out those old Sky Tripper videos with him and Matt and Pascal. Oh my God, they're brilliant! And it's just watching them, I'm just getting more and more into the idea that you know the flying is amazing, but the brother and sisterhood's even better. Going to the fly-ins and everything, just meeting everybody, hanging out with everybody. You know, I'm I'm so glad you guys do this show, and I wish I was home earlier so i can watch it at the beginning when i get home it's usually a little bit after eight o'clock my time but uh you know that you guys are doing this show and robert's doing the show and that everybody's educating and i think it really just creates more of a bond so i'm glad you guys are doing it you guys are my family you mm -hmm. guys are my family absolutely yeah i very you much enjoy doing uh, the show on mondays yep there we go and Kevin, Kevin, you're still the best paramotor pilot out there. <laughs> hey, hey, Dave, are you, Dave, did you say you're going to uh, North Carolina? Me? Param yes. No, Mr. Wolf. I'm done. I'm done till I'm done till bad apples. I've got to do some work. I've got to stop traveling and doing stuff. No. You can do work on the road. I'm just saying. No, I can't. I got to go to customers' houses. No, I'm when, done. When is bad apples? <laughs> Just Ed Apples is going to be some trike. He has to pay that baby off. <laughs> That's true. Bad what apples will be some. Bad apples will be sometime in May. I actually put down on my calendar today because I am definitely going to go to um, Oshkosh, and I want to do EFD. Those are the three for sure I want to do next year. So in Georgia in May, what's the temperature like? Nice, roughly hot. Georgia in May. Oh yeah, it's man. hot. You're going to want the so, air condition. So I'm dragging my camper is what you're saying up there. Yeah. Not the that's tent. Not such a, that's not such Oh, no, 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 no. You definitely don't want the tent. Okay. I'll, I'll take the, uh, I'll take the fuel costs and drag my camper up there. No problem. Yeah. Hopefully North Carolina at the end of September, man, is going to be pretty nice for camping, but. Mm. Right um, now, Saturday, the right now they're saying lows on Saturday is 49 degrees and then highs of uh, 78 but then it goes to, yeah, it goes to lows of 56 or 55 and then highs of 80, just like it was in Ohio. Yeah, well, when I travel with my camper, man, I try to chase 72 degrees. High of 72 is perfect. <laughs> don't have to run an air conditioner. Don't need a heater at night. You don't I need a heater at night at 49. I got a question for all of you guys, and I want, I'd like to ask this. If that's okay, Sean. Absolutely. Uh, I got a question because you know, I want you to answer this, too. Brian, get back in here. <laughs> so, but David, if David can answer, I'm so, as I'm watching these videos of Glenn uh, Tupper today, and Matt Minyard and Pascal, and they're they're traveling to Thailand and Vietnam, and they're flying over Buddhist temples, and I'm thinking, my God, we have nothing like that here for the most part. Now, David, I saw one of your videos. You're flying out in uh, was it Utah? Or, or Devil's Peak, Devil's, uh, yeah. Devil's, Tower. Devil's Tower, Devil's Tower. So that's pretty cool. But if you could think of, you know, one or two, and actually you just mentioned Travis, and actually I just sent uh, Travis a message about an hour ago saying, you know, because he, you know, on years when there's no COVID, uh, you know, that's what One Up Adventures does is they travel, they go to Italy, they go to, you know, down in Central uh, America. And I even said, would you consider doing Rio? Because one of my lifelong goals is to fly over the jesus statue at, in rio but is there any place here in the country that you could say this is my bucket list in america this is one place i definitely want to fly over or two places i definitely want to fly over 
because you know as i'm thinking about these and i'm watching these videos i'm thinking you know once you go to places like that once you fly over a buddhist temple or some of these great places what do you have to look forward to back here so that's like i'm i want to put together some sort of 10 10 places i want to fly over in america what, what would you guys put on that list Monument Valley. Okay. Monument Valley. Yeah. You're, so Monument Valley. Valley. <laughs> All right. What else? Mine is kind of silly and dangerous, but I want to fly over Niagara Falls on my paramotor. Ooh. That would be cool. I thought you were going to say Hoover Dam. No, that's been done. David. That's been done, but um, hasn't been done by you yet, right? Yeah, but I mean, it's been done. Oh, who cares if it's done? Do it for you. I would well, love to do Hoover Dam. See, I grew up in Southern California. I've been to the Hoover Dam copious amounts of times, so it's okay. not like that big of a splendor for me. Mm. But okay. I've been to Niagara Falls one time by accident because mm. we took the wrong lane. And when I saw it, it was not what I thought it was going to be. And I think it would be fantastic to fly a paramotor over it and see it from the air and it's like living <laughs> in splendor. That's great. There are some issues about Niagara Falls, though, and that is because it sits right on the border and there is some flight restrictions around the border now. So you might want to like that one might be difficult. You may have to get like some uh, permission prior, something like that. But, David, look, I've been trying to get a bunch of guys to do the, this type of thing that you're talking about for a while. So when you schedule this into your calendar, schedule me in there, too. Monument Valley, definitely. And since you're that close, you have to do Sedona. You have to, have to. And then thirdly, you have to do the dunes of Yuma. So you know where Yuma, Arizona is? You know those dunes over the? Yeah, I mean, you can hit those three, bang, 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 right there. Yeah, what Arizona about, has a lot to offer. So does, so does Utah. So just those two states you could do. I mean, you could spend months there. What uh, about? Uh, that I could think of that would be fantastic is, to go to Glamis, you know, if you've lived in Southern California, been to Southern California, you know where Glamis is. Yeah, that place on Thanksgiving weekend turns into its own city of dirt bikes, buggies, quads, literally mm. anything and everything badass that goes off road you can think of. And it would be amazing to just go shred that place from 25 feet above, watching everyone just have their million dollar toys all right below you kind of a thing but if you've ever been there on a holiday weekend you'll understand what i mean glamis on a holiday weekend is a trip that place goes crazy i've got six weeks this winter to go all over the southwest but i can't go into california it, is, did your mom tell you you're grounded they the won't support. let me take my guns <laughs> You just don't tell them. Leave them in the cupboard. Yeah, stay away from Massachusetts, too. Yeah, I know. I know. So one of the things I'd like to do is the four corners. That way I can launch and say that it took me four states to get off the ground. Yeah, that's <laughs> That's a yeah, good that idea. Was, I've run so long, it took me four states to get off the ground. <laughs> that's very funny. What about uh, you, Sean? Um, I actually was looking for different places to, uh, to, to do what you just said. And uh, if you Google cool places to fly over, it's mostly what, you know, small aircraft likes to fly over. But there's uh, 10 amazing places to fly over, 12 amazing places to fly over. And there are different places around mm -hmm. the United States that's neat. Um, I also been looking for uh, neat places to go visit where I could like land and go uh, do some different things just because of this random Navica that um, I found recently, which is really neat. So I've been trying to find uh, different places I could land, hike and see from the, you know, look at, look from the, from the paramotor, then come in and actually hike or look around or something and then take off again. Uh, mm -hmm. But nothing in particular. However, we do have three states that butt up together that is pretty much like the four corners, but we have three corners. Mm -hmm. So that would be pretty interesting to be able to just fly over three states by, hey, I'm over three states. All right, I'm done. You know, it was fun about going to um, you know, fly-ins, and I'm thinking of like where you live. You're in Alabama, correct? No. I'm in Arkansas. Arkansas. I knew it started with an A. But it's like flying to different states and seeing things that you don't <laughs> otherwise see. I knew it was an A. But like when I went to Palm Bay and flying out over the ocean. So to Shane, 
he does it all the time. For me, it was jaw dropping, right? So you know, that's that's the fun part about going to flying too. I would love to come down and fly. You know, all the different spots that you fly in Arkansas it would probably be all new to me for the first time and exciting. So I fly around a lot of mountains and a lot of rivers. Mm, um, awesome. Pinnacle Mountain is a great place to fly. Matter of fact, I can fly from pretty much my house. Um, by car it takes about an hour. I can, I can get there in about 20 minutes, land, and then hike the mountain, come back down, take off and fly back or fly someplace else. Mm. Haven't done hey, it yet. If it's any constellation, Dave, I've got a beach house and two paramotors. All you got to do is put your wing in your carry-on and head over for a weekend. Don't say it if you don't mean it. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I hosted Kyle, didn't I? That's true. I told you, I'd be happy to have you. That might be a, that might be a good idea. Maybe next year I might do a weekend trip for that. That's not I a might, bad idea. Fly out it, there is, in my paramotor. Oh, Trust boy. Me. I got a fantastic spot at the coast to take people go fly. Plenty of openness for safety and then tons of beautiful views from a quick little 20-minute flight. That's sweet. Sean, do you see a lot of Razorbacks from the air? The most, no. But the things that I have saw from the air, which is pretty neat because there are a lot of fields. So once you get, you know, over the mountains and over the trees, there's tons of fields. I mean, you can literally foot drag a, a five gallon tank dry and never come back around. I mean, it's just so much land uh, to, to do this. Uh, the things that I have seen, of course, are deer, which most people do see. Um, dogs, I've seen some wolves. Uh, maybe it was a David wolf. I don't know. Um, but the, but the I'm usually not on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but the coolest thing I think I ever saw was a couple of foxes, fox eye, fox, more than one fox, um, were, were running around. I thought that was pretty cool. I had a coyote you. eating a, a baby calf. Oh my! Whoa! I got so he's eating video. veal. It's on one of my one of my episodes. <laughs> I cannot oh. tell you how many times I've almost kicked a coyote. Foot dragging, wow. not kidding, because they really? hit and they wait until you're like right on top of them before they bolt. Really? I cannot tell you how many times. And of course, it's nothing I would show on YouTube because people would say, oh, my God, you're kicking a dog. Del. You know, be del. Del. I can't tell you how many times. Yeah, you'd be a dog. So I, um, I was at the fly in last week. Was it last week or the week before now? It was last week, right? Yeah, and sure. uh, actually, I put this on my video. I flew over and a bald eagle flew out in front of me and yep. i just circled that was that was the best thing i've ever seen by far you were away. pretty excited about it <laughs> i was cussing yes. <laughs> I, I had a bald i had a bald eagle fly underneath me also oh, that's awesome yeah were you yep. flipping out it was, it was cool. I was trying to keep up with it. I, there's actually two of them. One, one went up this way, so I wasn't able to get him on video. But another one was flying right underneath me, and I got it right between my legs and took a picture. Wow, a picture that's so cool. On my Instagram, too. That was pretty cool, yeah. Very cool. So what's the cool, most cool thing that you guys seen while flying? Somebody else flying? <laughs> yeah, when you're, when you're flying... What's the coolest thing that you all seen so far? I mean, anything, a, a, a place, an obstacle. Uh, I think to me, the most coolest thing I've ever seen was uh, flying uh, through some mist and seeing my halo around it as I was going through. Yeah, I got, I'm doing, I'm doing editing video from the fly-in of last weekend or the weekend before, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you, you can totally just see a gigantic, like, it is a huge halo right around and the shadow you can see the paramotor wing and everything right inside of it what That's other cool always, things have, has anybody seen awesome well i don't know if it's the coolest thing i've ever seen but n not too long ago we were out flying and we had three guys with flex wing trikes and if you don't know what a flex wing trike is it's basically a hang glider with a little motorized cart that hangs underneath it and you sit and fly mm, yes, yeah. a glider. And there was three of them that came over a field. And because I fly with an aviation radio, we were all in the same air band. And so we joined up and all of us sat there over this field, just doing a bunch of acro. Oh. And it was amazing. It was amazing to watch what these guys with these flex wing trikes could get them to do. 
I mm. mean, if you think wing overs on a paramotor looks cool, you should see when these guys go almost full inverted on a flex wing trike. You're just like, wow. Wow. That's something. Watch, and, and we're talking guys that are like few years beyond retirement. I mean, these aren't young guys and they're just smashing. So hmm. I think that's probably the biggest part that makes it really cool for me is knowing that as long as I'm smart, I still have all those years to look forward to in aviation. So watching them do it is cool. And then reminding myself that my journey is still very young in aviation. So I have a long way to go. It's humbling. That is pretty cool. I saw nine wild boar down at Aviator flying around that area down there. And two coyotes were coming in stalking them. Oh, mm. wow. That is cool. That's neat. I just seen That's the largest why you need buck. a gun, David. I caught a fish on my glider. <laughs> I just seen the I just seen the largest buck I've ever seen from the air in Ohio. I actually came back as, as soon as it happened. I went back and landed just so I could watch the video. I yeah. was just like, I cannot believe it. It was huge. I've seen huge ones this year around here. Huge. And in fact, Todd Falstead, who flew with me, said, I've never seen bucks that big in my life. Yeah, I don't, that was the only one I saw was a, I, a big buck. That was the only big one I've seen. I've seen a hundred other does and, and little bucks, but this thing stood up and I was like, oh my God. And I yeah. was like, Shane likes big bucks and he cannot and lie. I cannot lie. <laughs> <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> Brian, if you're trying to talk, we can't hear you. <laughs> no, we can't hear you at all. You're not on mute either. No, my father in law. My father in law is a hunter. He has a lovely room of death. Mm. <laughs> I in my bedroom's that well. I have lots of things hanging on my wall in my bedroom. That is your wife, is your wife one of them? A lot of ways. Not yet. Not <laughs> not not yet. <laughs> your wife is not one. Okay. Not yet. <laughs> you know, there's places you can get suspension. Never mind. No. Well. Aye, aye, aye. I'm sorry. Well, I think I just demonetized PPG Grandpa's. Uh, <laughs> <show>. <laughs> well, I tried hanging some things on the wall, but I used a stud finder. It just keeps going off around me. I don't. I can't ever find it. Oh. Just That's saying. Because you have a big nail in your head. <laughs> <laughs> hey, David Wolf. Um, sure. You yeah. were talking about uh, cool places to fly around. Um, what what kind of places are you thinking about flying around that'd be really cool? I don't know, and that's why I asked a question because I, I I don't know. I mean, I the things that that uh, David mentioned, those places, yeah. Um, but like nothing like a Buddhist temple. Holy cow! It's like you want to leave the country to go fly. I but, I uh, want to throw in real quick that uh, uh, Matt Minyard. I got a chance to see him. I went to. Uh, he's he's at uh, Midwest Power Tower Gliding, right? No, Matt Minyard is Louisiana. Louisiana. So this would be Matt Massey that, or something like that. Possibly. Yes. With, with, I think so. Uh, that's right. He he takes people down to Mexico, mm. and does. Uh, SIV classes. Mm, okay. Well, Utah is another one. I was just thinking that too. Uh, you know, I want to, I don't know if we'll have the next year or the year after, but I want to get up to Santa Croce and spend some time up there probably in two years and do my paragliding training with him. So you guys flown, whoever's flown aviators, did you guys go around Bach tower? Not that that's like a huge thing, but I thought it was I just pretty kind cool. Of, I just kind of floated over by the weed factory and just, Hung out there for a while. <laughs> Try to stay I visited high. Bach Tower, but I didn't fly I over it. there. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm looking on, on Google to see. I just typed in things to see from your paramotor, and just absolutely nothing pops up. Yeah. We'll have to create a list. This might be so, something to, to definitely do. Yeah. I know this is like super non specific, but I want to go fly like a, a someplace that's like very southern Florida, like the Keys. Yeah. Or Hawaii, um, Fiji, Bali, some some place that's just epic tropicalness. Like There's not some. not because of its commercialization, but be just because of its epic tropicalness. The the beautiful water, the reef, the animals, just all of it. Yeah, there's great. a there's a guy that flies. He he uh, has a YouTube channel. Let me see here. 
he flies out of the keys all the time. He lives down there. And Is that about Jacquez? No, uh, hold on here. But he shows some of the biggest damn sharks. <laughs> flies right over, and I'm like, okay, dude, you're not high enough to uh, get out of trouble <laughs> if things go wrong. And, uh, <laughs> you're showing me gigantic sharks, but he flies out of a f- baseball field. You know who'd be a great person to ask, and he was, I don't know if he's still in the chat, or, but I know he was watching before, was Harley Milne, 50X Challenge. I mean, they yes, have been yeah. to all 50 states. He'd be a good person to ask what he's seen and some of his what, favorite places. What so. is the best, yeah, what is his favorite place to have flown? Because he's had to get up, up to at least 500 uh, feet on each flight, correct? Correct. Scott Hall. Uh, he, was a pro, he was a pro wrestler back in the day. No, this if you look him up, Scott Hall, he has, I mean, he's got the keys, power, paragliding, nitro motor. I mean, he flies all kind of, like it's just beautiful. He has a massive uh great uh hammerhead shark oh, wow. video. So less than four minutes long, a damn shark's huge. I'm like, you're not high enough if things go wrong, just so you know. So down in Florida, I think uh, Rick had talked about this. They do a um a, a, a lighthouse tour on paramotors down on the uh, west coast of florida a lighthouse tour wow they'll fly to like several different lighthouses yeah that'd be kind of okay. do something do something like that up in maine would be amazing yeah i gotta ch- check with uh jason um and he lives over on the west coast um and mm-hmm. see if if he's uh, heard of that yeah. that sounds like something that would be awesome that'd be fun that'd i be just fun and- I searched for cool things to see from Google Earth. That might be something to check out because there are a lot of weird things that you can see from Google Earth. I don't know if we find something close to us, you know, from to to where we go. But that might be neat. Yeah. I'm going to let you go. I I appreciate you having me on today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. And and appreciate you too. And definitely come over here anytime that you want to, every every um, week, whoever wants to jump on that has been on our podcast as a guest can definitely yep. come on every week. Um, even this crazy David Wolf guy, if he wants to I was going to say, on. am I allowed to come back? <laughs> That's You're more than welcome. Right. Good to see you. Jump Hold on. on. Door is always open. Absolutely. Hold on, Dave. You have to be a guest on our show first to have the opportunity to come that back anytime true. you want. Oh. That is true. David Wolf, do you want to be on next week? <laughs> I know, Kevin, Kevin, the only problem is, is I can't commit to being on at eight o'clock that's my only challenge if I can get home and, and get on but you may have to start without me because usually I'm getting home after eight o'clock for my evening appointments the only night I don't work and I take off work on the evenings is Wednesday night for other reasons as you know so but you'll other than that to, Monday through Thursday nights I work you'll have to start without me that's what she said yeah. <laughs> <laughs> before before I go, I want to amend my testimony. Okay. I, I, I did fly in West Virginia and I had forgotten that. Okay. Yeah. Have a great night, guys. Dave, right. it's good seeing you again. Thank you so much. Yeah, and don't forget to post that cool video that we want to see. It'll be on there tonight, later tonight. All, All right. right. We'll God bless. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Dave. Yeah, Sean, I mean, we could talk about that, but I'd love to, if as long as, you know, I might be a little bit late to the party. What is a little bit late? Like five minutes or half an hour, an yeah, hour? Really? It, well, honestly, well, it wouldn't be an hour. It depends on the customer, usually. But, I mean, I can also contact you and let you know where I'm at, too. So right. That's true. Well, we could uh, talk about it. Yeah, we, we can. Uh, I can always start can... in the car. I can always start in the car ride home, so that would JP work. JP does that, so if JP okay. can do that, you can do that. Okay, I can probably make that work. Just make sure you fill up. Just fill up your blinker fluid first before you get on the show. I always keep spare blinker (laughs) fluid in the trunk. Blinker fluid. If you hear a weird clunking sound, it's your piston return springs. Yes. (laughs) Wow. Linda, I got a message yesterday, an email message, which just was a phone number, and it says I'm in San Diego in a cigar shop, and I just saw your video on right this minute. And it took me a while to figure out that it was uh, Pira Gringo. Oh, how funny. I'm like, what the hell? I finally put the phone number into my contacts to see if it would come up and said Anthony Pira Gringo. I'm like, oh, sweet. 
Yeah, That's I can't cool. believe that. I, I didn't even know that was going to be on in California. Like, well, I guess you saw it though. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, Crazy. I did put your number on the bathroom stall with a for a good time <laughs> call above it. I'm sure you did. <laughs> For a crazy no. time call. Yeah. For a crazy no, time. That's just so insane. Honestly. I know. I, I know. I just like, when I saw that, I was just kind of watching, you know, because I love that show anyway, but, and all of a sudden you, that came on there, I'm like, holy, and I started like screenshotting, you know, on the TV, and I'm like, <laughs> I know this guy. Oh I was scared God. to death. I thought they're gonna make me look like the biggest yeah. idiot, so I was so worried like all day until I heard until I saw the video. I'm like, oh, that actually came out pretty good. Yeah. What are we good. talking? What are we talking about? I do you know the TV show Right This Minute? No. Yeah, have you ever heard of it? It's the link. It's the link that we put on our Claire Prop TV chat that um, that David Wolf is not on yet because he hasn't been a guest. Shane oh. was busy oh, driving oh, home man. from Ohio. He missed. Yes, me. I was. I was on. I was on my way home. So the video I put out of me going into the river, mm -hmm. um, Rick Davies sent it over to right this minute. And oh, they, he they, did it. He did yeah, it. Okay. Yeah, he did it. Okay. And <laughs> so then, of course, I was like, they got, in, the yeah, they got in touch with me to see if I, they could get my permission to use it. So I said, sure. And I think it was like Tuesday or Wednesday after the fly. It was like just a couple of days later, they did this whole promotion or not a promotion, but they, they took my video, edited it down. And you know me going into the water, me holding the fish up in front of me that I caught on the glider. <laughs> that was pretty cool. And then me landing in front of the guys and like, and Travis going, "What happened to yeah. your wing? Why is your wing all muddy?" Yeah. And the fish, the fish. Yeah, and then me saying, and then me saying, "Those clouds are so muddy up there." <laughs> <laughs> but they were very empathetic too, and they just, you know, well, I can't cool. believe. They showed all three. You talk about taking no more than three attempts on taking off. <laughs> it took every last one of them to get that wet glider. Hey, David. Hey, David. I saw that. I saw that video, and your wing looked not only wet; it looked sandy and muddy as well. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. How how long did it take to clean that wing? Uh, it's still in process. I was going to say not long. <laughs> <laughs> So when I got home, I, 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 what I did was I, I put it up on my, my fence and I hosed it off and I, then I laid it on the ground and I scrubbed it and then I hosed it off again and then it's still dirty, but it's better. So, so what do you got to do to get it? I mean, how do you get that all out of there? You don't. You don't. Not, unless, unless your wing goes into salt water you really don't want to do anything to clean it other than like he did with the hose in the water. I mean, you want to rinse it thoroughly yeah. and get as much junk out of the inside as possible, but yeah. using, using a cloth or, or any type of right. detergent, you want to avoid right. that at all costs. Correct. I haven't, how do you I haven't flown it yet, actually. I haven't flown since I've been home, so I'm sure I'll find stuff when I go out and kite it next time. Okay, so but, Dave, I have to ask you one question. How sketched was it doing a spiral down it was fine. Look, it, in three minutes, the whole glider was dry. If you think about it, if you're flying, the whole thing it still had mud down. in it. It still had mud. mud in it. D didn't no, feel no, any no. different. Come on. Mm. Oh. Okay. Uh oh. Brown, take a brown. Wow. I think I have to go, guys. <laughs> so uh, we're here. I, I gotta go. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta go. I'll be right. next Monday. <laughs> So, so we'll see you next Monday, David Wolf. I'll be, yes, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll be honored to be a guest. I'll talk to you then. All right, I'll later, later. Bye. Yeah, All right. JP, I sent you that package today, by the way. I don't know if you saw my note. So you, it's in the mail. You'll get it uh, the next couple of days. All right. Bye, guys. See you Wednesday. All right. Hey, buddy. Monday, actually. Oh, Wednesday well, for him. I got a show on yeah. Wednesday. I hope you join. That's right. Yeah. That's right. We'll see you Wednesday. <laughs> Jeff he, came Coyne, back, like, he came back to say, no, we got a show on Wednesday. No. <laughs> All right, I really got to go now. Goodbye. Right, bye. <laughs> Volume six is out. Oh my goodness! Are we like? Awesome. On, are we still on the live show or the after show? I get confused here. Well, at, at eight o'clock we go to the after show. However, we didn't. Um,
let just anybody on there. I apparently will let David Wolf on here and we chat with oh. him. So this is actually, we're, all, we're rolling on uh, two hours here. So um, let's leave on an awesome note. You know, we're going to have David Wolf next week. Uh, if you wanted to watch this live, um, you need to go to clearproptv.com and watch us live every Monday night at 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Did I did it, do that right? I think I'm going to get this right. If you want to check out uh, Kevin Can Fly, just go to kevincanfly.com. Never trust right. a skinny chef Shane. We got the links down below. JP, Linda Anderson. Oh, Linda Anderson. Yeah, honey. Tell, tell us there's another .com that we need to go check out, isn't there? Paraglidingshop.com on Thursday night. Dot com, of course. Dot I'll make com. sure that we go and check that out. Thank you, uh, Linda. Yeah, I appreciate he's got, that. He, he has a video out um, when he flew a few days ago over the weekend. At yep, Blossom. Off of Blossom. Yep. Did yeah. you guys catch it? It's fun. It's a really fun video. It's really cute. Yeah. He just like. I want, I want to know when he's taking his mama up. That's what I want to know. I know. I'm working on it. That will be it. interesting. That will be interesting. I know. He won't take me up, but somebody who's, you know, tandem trained, whatever. I'm, yeah. I'm getting my instructor's rating. I'm going to get my tandem and uh, all that stuff too. Hopefully I'll have one, my, uh, my, my paramotor school open next summer. So lots of, okay. lots of, lots of training. I'm already over 200 hours of flying. So hopefully by next summer, when I open up, I'll be closer to 500 hours of flying. That'd be really cool. And of course, Chris go. Wheeler. My dog is <laughs> joking because I fed him some stuff that he shouldn't have had. <laughs> so thank you, Chris Wheeler, for being on too. You guys are awesome. If you want to listen to this oh, podcast awesome. and, and not uh, look at our ugly mugs, just go to paratalk.org and check us out. <laughs> and of course, whatever your favorite podcast application is, just search for PPG Grandpa's Paramotor Podcast, and you will find us. This is episode 33. Thank you very much for watching, and we will catch you next time. Now, we're going to stop the live stream, but we're still going to talk, so don't go nowhere. Guys. Oh, we are? Oh, yeah. okay. I thought you were, we were like all leaving. Nah. Yeah, so, 